We continue in our sermon series of knowing scripture to change our future. Today we're talking about a mother's persistence. A mother's persistence. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. Matthew 15, 21 through 28. I hope you'll have that open in front of you. We will read that entire text. But let's go before God in prayer and then get right into our message. Father, thank you for our mothers. We thank you for them so much, but there really isn't words for what they do. And Father, that's not to say we, we know that our dads and grandparents and everybody does so much, but our mothers, especially today, we thank you. And we should be thanking them more than we ever do, uh, definitely more than one day a year for sure. So Father, as we think about our mothers that are with us and those of us who have mothers that have gone on, we thank you for the time. We thank you for the influence, Father, because we know that the influence remains with us. But especially, Father, when that mother was godly. So be with us today, please, as we go through your word, as we talk about a mother's persistence. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we continue our sermon series this morning by looking at passages, biblical accounts that we've all heard many times before, but I want us to listen with new and attentive ears, and here's the reason why, because the Lord has the way of using his word to speak directly into our life at just the right time in a way that we've never heard it before, as long as we are willing to listen to him. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if, if, if you believe what Jesus is saying, that he is the truth and that it's that truth that we need to have in our life in order to be able to be with the Father, then we must seek the truth of Jesus Christ. He also said these words in John chapter 8, verse 32, that if you hold to my teachings, which is the Bible, if you hold to my teachings, you're really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So I pray that we all want our future to be better. I pray that we want our future to be more rooted in Christ and in his word. However, how do we change our future if we want to change it? Well, we need to do that by scriptures and the lessons in which it teaches because they are timeless. And they apply to us no matter where we are in our walk in life. So true freedom, according to Jesus, comes by knowing his word and then following what it says. But what does it set us free from? Well, the shackles of sin, of course, but we can break that down into things that we all know well, like fear and shame and guilt and culture and people's opinions and self-centeredness and self-pity and anger and arrogance, and we could go on. And each week we ask ourselves these two things. There are two ways that we can change our future. One is to the better. In other words, we actually study the word of God. We know his scriptures in order that we might be tra transformed and changed in our living and in our thinking. And then there's the second way, and that's continue to do what the world wants you to do. And you will change, but it will be to the worse. It'll be further and further away from God, regardless how the world wants to make it look so pretty. But it is your choice. You get to pick what you're going to do. So the question is, what will you do with your opportunity to change? Will you squander it, or will you actually use it to become what God has created you to be? Now this morning, we're going to continue by looking at another familiar account as we look at scriptures, one that we actually know as the faith of the Canaanite woman. So follow along with me in Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And the woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted, and, your, and her daughter was healed that very hour. Now, before we get into our first point this morning, I, I want to go ahead and briefly explain to you what's going on here so that we can have a better understanding. Jesus is beginning to prepare not only himself, but also his disciples for what is about to come. Now, I got a picture I want to show you real fast. So here is the Sea of Galilee, and this is where he's been doing most of the ministry, and now he is actually moving up to Tyre and Sidon. So I wanted to make sure that you knew it's on the coast of the Mediterranean. I wanted to make sure that you were able to see that so that you have kind of an idea. That is all Gentile area. 
all Gentiles. So he needed to go to a place where the crowds were not pressing him as they were, by the way, at Galilee. And the only place for that to actually happen is to go into the Gentile regions. And so Jesus begins heading there with his disciples, specifically into the areas of Tyre and Sidon, which is to the northwest of Galilee. Now, there are a couple of things for you and I to think about when it comes to this passage. Let me start with the most obvious, and that is simply this. People often struggle with this passage because they feel that Jesus sounds a bit rough when he's talking to this woman who's asking for help. And while your ears hear Jesus and hear what may sound rough to you, what you and I need to understand is that Jesus Christ knows the hearts of all people, including this woman. And what we do not, what we, what we, what we need to know and understand for sure is we are not clear as to what she was thinking, what was going on in her heart. So when you and I think about what Jesus said, we should never assume to judge Jesus by the sound of something in our 2019 ears, by what was going on at the time. We do not have any idea about what the woman's heart was going through. The second thing we need to remember is that the Canaanite people were not just ordinary enemies of Israel. They were ancestral enemies of Israel. Going all the way back to the founding of Israel, if you will, the Canaanites, like the Romans, were not very fond of Israel at all. As a matter of fact, they hated them. Now, that's not to say that I am saying this woman hated Israel, but it's not to say also that there wasn't some contempt in her heart either. I just want you to be aware to keep in mind a few things when we read this biblical account. Remember, to Jesus, it's not about rival countries. It's not about where you're from. He is God. Jesus came in order to seek and save the lost. No matter who you were, no matter where you were, his goal was to bring all people into a relationship of worship between them and God. And he wants them to recognize their need, not only for God, but that only God can heal them. One final thing for you and I to keep in mind. What Jesus does here at Tyre and Sidon actually begins to set the stage for the fact that the gospel message will be carried to the entire world. The gospel was not just for Israel. It was for all people. Okay, so with all that in mind, let's go ahead this morning and begin our first point. Our first point is simply this. Lord, help me. Now, this is a phrase that we all know. Why? Well, because we've all said it before. There may be times in your life that you felt it as you were praying, and then, of course, needless to say, you think you didn't get an answer, or at least not the answer that you were trying to pick up on, and that we've talked about this position many times or this feeling many times, and the reason why is because we've all been there. As Jesus enters the region of Tyre and Sidon, a Canaanite woman approaches him. Once again, follow along in 21 through 25. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. And so his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away. She keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And the woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. Now, the love of a mother, by the way, is deep and a tremendous love. One that really only a mother can understand. It's one of sacrifice of many things, by the way. Sacrifice of time. Sacrifice of sleep. Of privacy and of space. Being a mother, by the way, is a job that comes with very few things. And at times, by the way... Seems it comes with very little reward, but we all know better than that. I mean, we know better than that from the deepest part of our hearts because there is great reward in a mother who seeks the Lord. Abraham Lincoln once said these words, no man is poor who has had a godly mother. And by the way, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. This Canaanite woman at first isn't seeking Jesus the Messiah. She is seeking Jesus, the Israelite son of David, who was a prophet, who can do miracles, who is a great teacher, and who can help her daughter. And by the way, this mother is in need of a miracle for her daughter, and that's her number one concern right now. But there's something about this thinking that I believe that you and I can relate to. Why? Because we all do this thinking as well. I think every single one of us has come before the Lord before with a request that really wasn't addressing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, but it was addressing Jesus, the one who can fix what I need fixing right now. Sort of like a cosmic handyman, not the God of all creation. But what we need to understand is that this thinking is flawed. 
It's flawed because Jesus is first and foremost the creator God, the savior of the world who has come to save us from our sins. Anything short of that, of seeing Jesus in that way, is not really seeing Jesus for who he is, but we're seeing Jesus for what we want. Just let me ask a question of you and I both for us to think about. How many times have you ever approached Jesus with that mindset? I've got a problem and I need you to fix it. As opposed to you are God. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Or hallowed be your name. How many times have we ever approached with that mindset? We come before him with a request like he's a vendor, not with humility and with worship and with praise and with honor. But this mother does something that I think we also understand as well. She cries out for help. As a matter of fact, there are three things that she cries out for. Number one is simply this. She cries out for mercy. The sincere cry for mercy is something that Jesus always hears. However, when it comes to your cry for mercy, keep in mind there are two things that are often forgotten and overlooked. The first thing is this. The cry of mercy must be based in faith. And the one that you're crying out to, and let me say that again, it must be based in faith and the one that you're crying out to, it must be sincere. It should not be self-centered. It should not be selfish. It should be sincere in seeking of help. But the second thing is your cry for mercy must be to Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ. Because the fact is, quite frankly, there are many people that cry out for help, but they don't cry out to Jesus, and much to their dismay, because they're left stranded. Secondly, by the way, she cries out to the son of David. Now, the Canaanite people, as well as all the other nations that were around Israel, had heard about the coming of the Messiah. The Jews had made that known. And by the way, some of them even wanted to see the coming of the Messiah. And so then Jesus begins proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. And he begins doing all the things that the prophets said would mark the Messiah. The sick will be healed. The blind will see. The lame will walk again. Remember back, uh, if you think about John the baptizer, remember what he was concerned about? He sent some of his disciples to go to ask Jesus a question. And that is in Matthew chapter 11, verse 2. Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? But Jesus responds by saying these words in Matthew 11, verses 4 through 6. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Now, why does Jesus tell John's disciples to go back to him and to tell him those things? Well, because John knew what the scripture said. He knew what Isaiah 29 and Isaiah 61 said. And so when he heard the response that was given to him, he knew that, yes, Jesus was the Messiah. He was the one that everyone was waiting on. So this woman cries out to the son of David, a messianic title, because she recognizes what he is capable of doing, that he is a healer, that he can perform miracles. And that's exactly what this woman needs at the time. She needs a miracle. But the third thing that she cries out for, she cries out for mercy, and her cry is not selfish. In other words, she cries out out of love for another person, her daughter. This woman, by the way, had a tremendous need. Her daughter was under the influence of Satan. In other words, she was demon-possessed. The presence of evil was in her life, and there was nothing that this mother could do, or anyone else for that matter. This mother had two great qualities, by the way. She had a deep love and a oneness with her child. She saw her daughter's problem as her own, and so she said, Lord, have mercy on me. Not have mercy on my child, but have mercy on me. And this showed her genuine love and her genuine concern. She sought the help of the right person, even though this woman didn't have the complete understanding as to who Jesus truly was. She knew that he was the only one that could actually help her daughter. Not the false gods of Tyre, not the false gods of Sidon, but Jesus, the son of David, was the only one that could help her. Let me ask you this morning, just something to think about. How many people do you know, maybe even yourself, who have children that are under the influence of evil. Now, obviously, maybe not the situation that we're talking about in this passage, but there's a tremendous influence of sin and shame in their life, and it breaks your heart because you can't do anything about it. You've tried. And then anybody else you've asked to help out can't seem to do anything about it. And by the way, how many other loved ones have situations in their life 
that that could be greatly benefited if we, on their behalf, went to the Lord and cried out for mercy on their behalf. Sincerely cried out, by the way. By the way, this is called intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer is where you and I go to the Lord on behalf of someone else, asking God to intervene, to issue, or to come in and change the situation or the issue that's going on. But when we pray, we must have faith in who God is. Do you believe that God is Emmanuel, God with us? Do you believe that he is the great I am with power and authority in his hand to do everything that he says he can do, as we spoke about last week? And when we pray, we must ask him to help us to accept whatever his will may be. For most situations in our life, whether it's friends, family members, loved ones, all we have is intercessory prayer. That's all we have. But it is also one of the most powerful things that a believer has because it can change everything. So when it comes to intercessory prayer, the question is, how much do you love the person in which you're praying for? How much do you really love them? Do you love them enough to lift them up before Jesus because he is their only hope? Because he is God? I mean, do you love them enough to do that? Or have you even taken the time to talk to Jesus about the person or about the situation that they happen to be in at all? The Canaanite woman, who at the beginning didn't fully grasp who Jesus was, knew for a fact what Jesus was capable of doing. And he could do anything. And so she went to him in humble worship on her knees and she cried out, Lord, help me. From when we first see her beginning to follow Jesus and crying out for mercy until she comes before him on her knees, there's a change in her thinking. There's a change in her attitude about who Jesus really is. But how do we know this? Well, that'll take us to our next point this morning. The master's table. Matthew chapter 15, verses 23 through 27. Jesus did not answer a word. And so his disciples came to her, or came to him and urged him, send her away, for she's crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And the woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat crumbs that fall from the master's table. See, we have no idea how long this woman had been following Jesus and his disciples. We have no idea about that. However, we do know, we do know that it's at least been for a while. I mean, a good period of time. It was long enough, by the way, that the disciples asked Jesus to please just send her away because she would not stop crying out for him to help her. So please just send her away. However, the entire time that she is crying out, Jesus doesn't answer her at all. Now the disciples assume, and we all know it's not good to assume, but they assume that this meant that Jesus wasn't going to concern himself with this woman. But that's not at all what Jesus is doing. So what is happening? Well, this is where I believe that Jesus only knows the answer to the question. But I do know this, Jesus is omniscient. That means he knows all things. He knew this woman's heart. So as I just said a minute ago, somewhere in this journey, the heart of this woman began to change in how she saw Jesus. She was no longer seeing him as a miracle worker and a miracle worker only that could benefit her daughter, but now she saw him as the master of all people. In other words, during this journey, there was a major change in this woman's heart. Somewhere during this journey that she was on, as hard as it may have been, and we don't know how long it was, her perspective about Jesus changed. And there was no way to think about anything else other than the plan of God that this is happening the way it does. He did not answer her so that she would continue the journey. He did not answer her that she would continue to follow. Because her following Jesus, even though it may have been hard at times, she knew that he was the only answer. She knew that only he was God. Now let me ask you, does this hit home? Because I think for many of us, the journey with Jesus, the studying about him, the understanding what he calls us to, the getting to know him more intimately through his word, the walking through a few valleys, the crying out for help, will finally lead us to understand who Jesus is. And by the way, not only who he is, but what he can do. And what he is capable of doing. And as soon as we find out that Jesus is so much more than a cosmic handyman, 
who sits around waiting for you and I to beckon him and to give us something else, that he is truly the God of all creation, that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, that he is the one true God. You see, I think that through the silence and through the following, there come a greater understanding for this young lady. That through the silence and the following, she began to see him differently. As much as we may hate it, the journey helps you and I to grow in our walk. The journey helps you and I to grow in our understanding, whether there is a silence or whether there are obstacles. This Canaanite woman, by the way, had three major obstacles to overcome during this journey. And I want you to listen to them and see if any of them apply to you today. The first obstacle, by the way, was the silence of Jesus. I mean, the fact that Jesus did not respond to her cry the first time or two, or we don't really know how many, her desire to ask for a cure for her daughter caused her to hang on and to keep going with the journey no matter how long it took. I firmly believe that this woman knew that Jesus was not ignoring her. I firmly believe that because word travels fast at this time in history, and she knew who Jesus was. Even though by our knowledge, this is the first time she's ever around him in person, she knew enough about him to know know that he did not ignore people. So I don't believe she ever thought that he was ignoring her. And so her love and desperation to get the help that she needed for her daughter kept kept her following the disciples regardless of the fact that Jesus did not say a word. But there was a second objection as well, and that was that, that of the disciples that she had overcome. See, it was an assumption from the disciples that since Jesus had not said anything to the woman's pleading and that they were embarrassed by the fact that she was continuing to follow him, and since they were all raised to believe that Gentiles were no good, that this woman was undeserving of the help of Jesus Christ. So in their objection, they go to Jesus and they say to him, send her away because she's embarrassing embarrassing us. She keeps yelling out. We don't want to send her away. And I think that there were a couple of lessons, by the way, that the disciples had to learn even in this. And that's why Jesus allows it to go on. Sometimes it takes a little time for faith to wake up in a person's life. Sometimes it just takes some time. So it, may take, it may take time for one person to learn that they cannot just approach God and ask for something and have it handed to them because that's what he is as a vending machine. That when you come before God, there must be true faith. There must be a sincere heart. There must be a real seeking after Jesus. And for some people, by the way, that just takes time in their life. And another thing that they needed to learn was that the love of God was for every single person. There were none that God despises or feels that it's not worthy of his grace and of his love and of his mercy. But then there's that statement that Jesus makes to this woman that I know people struggle with hearing. And that is, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, you may feel that that statement's a bit contradictory of what I just said. But I want you to know that it's absolutely not. As a matter of fact, the statement makes great sense. See, the Old Testament prophets had already said that the Messiah would come first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And why would he go first to the Jews? Well, because why would you not first go to the believers of God as opposed to those who worshipped many false gods or many false idols? Why would you not go to the people of God first? And so what Jesus says to the woman is not a statement of condemnation, as a matter of fact, or that she was less important. It was a statement of fact. It was a statement of fact. Jesus was fulfilling a prophecy. However, this does not make her any less important than anybody else, and she is certainly not despised by Jesus because she was a Gentile. See, the good news of the kingdom of God was going to be going to the entire world. All the people of the world would have the opportunity to hear and be saved. But this was a time of preparation for Jesus and for his disciples. And believe it or not, there are a couple of lessons that this woman needed to learn as well. And when I think about them, they are still lessons that we all need to learn and take seriously. Listen to them and think about them in your own life. This woman needed to learn persistence. She needed to learn humility. She needed to learn trust. And when I think about it as far as today, it can be very hard for you and I to think about these things in a drive-through mentality because that's what we have. We want it now and we want it any way we can get it. And this can lead you and I to a lot of bad stuff. This woman needed to learn these things. And by the way, so did the disciples. And so do you and I, I believe. But the second thing, this woman needed to know that there was only one true God. 
Remember, all she knew all of her life was that there were a multiplicity of gods, false gods at that, that could do different things. And none of them worked. And of course they wouldn't because they were fake. In her seeking of Jesus, she realizes that there's only one master of the house, and that master is Jesus. Her only hope in the world was in Jesus. The only Lord and master was Jesus. The only one worthy of worship and to be revered was Jesus. Why? Because Jesus alone could attend to our needs and to our concerns. So when we consider the church today, there are many people, by the way, that pray with no expectancy whatsoever that God is going to respond. The prayers go out of their mouth and they float in the air and their faith doesn't go any further than their body. But then there's the prayer of persistence that's relentless in love, solid in faith and trust, and rooted in the fact that Jesus is the one that can actually take care of all things. Now, I don't know where you are when it comes to that kind of prayer, but I do know this. You must have faith because faith is what makes the difference. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, And without faith it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Well, let me ask you, how are you doing in that area? Jesus then makes a statement that catches so many people off guard. And that is this. It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. This statement was only to say this. It is not right to take the food that belongs to the children and to give it to others that are simply allowed to be in the house and that are not children. That's what's being said. Now let me say that one more time. It's not right to take the food of the children and to give it to others that are just simply allowed to be in the house and that are not children. Much like the statement of the lost of Israel, this statement was saying that there was a priority in what Jesus was doing. And while time for the message of the gospel would be given to, to the world, it was not right now. At that moment. However, this woman now understands who Jesus is to a much fuller extent than she did when she started following him. And her response shows not only her faith and what Jesus can do, but in her recognition as to who Jesus was. He was the master. And she says these words Yes, Lord, but even the dogs can eat the crumb that falls from the master's table. Now, let me read that one more time. Yes, Lord, but even the dogs can eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Now, I want you to notice that she does not say the crumbs that fall from the children's table. She said from the master's table. She was stating in the affirmative that Jesus was the master of the table. He was the one that sets it up. He was the one that gives it out. He could do whatever he wanted because he was the master. And that will lead us this morning to our last point. You have great faith. What is faith? How do we define it? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. You see, there was one thing that absolutely stands out about this woman. Even in the beginning, with her lack of understanding as to who Jesus was, she had a solid faith. She knew that Jesus was capable of doing what she needed for her daughter, and there was no doubt about that whatsoever. Her faith was so strong that she would not quit, even though it appeared that all the odds were against her. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. Despite the silence from Jesus that she faced in the beginning of her journey, she continued following and asking Jesus for mercy, so that her need would be met. Despite the irritation that maybe she may have felt in her and her own heart as she was following them or what was say, being said about her by the disciples, even with all that irritation that may have been there, she continued her journey, asking Jesus to have mercy on her and to attend to her need. And despite the opposition that the, that the disciples said to Jesus, send her away, she's a Gentile, just send her away because she won't shut up. Even with all of that, she continued her journey asking Jesus for mercy so that she would help her or he would help her out in her need. Despite all of that, this woman had the faith that caused her journey to move on with the Lord no matter what because the only one that could meet her need was him. Matthew chapter 15, verse 28, Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted, and her daughter was healed that very hour. But let me make sure that we understand something very clearly. It isn't the fact that she had faith that her daughter was healed. It's that she had faith in the right person. 
See, you can have an absolute faith in science. You can have an absolute faith in trees and in the environment. You can have an absolute faith in hundreds of false gods and deities that are around the world and cults and myths. You can have absolute faith in all of that. You can even have absolute faith in your own self. But that and $47 will get you a small cup of coffee at Starbucks. See, misplaced faith is just as useful as no faith at all. Now, let me say that one more time. Misplaced faith is just as useful as no faith at all. And I pray that you understand that because your faith must be in the creator God of the universe. It must be in Jesus Christ and in him alone. The Canaanite's faith was right where it needed to be. That Jesus not only commends her for her faith, but he rewards her for her faith. And her daughter was healed that very hour. Now, I want you to remember that this healing was a remote healing. In other words, the daughter was not with the mother. The mother was on this journey by herself, and yet her faith was so certain in Jesus. She knew that Jesus could heal even from a long distance. And for that reason, Jesus says her faith was great faith. Now, the Greek word is megas. It's where we actually get the English word mega from. And this is what it means. It means great, tremendous, loud. That's what it means. So what Jesus was saying to this, about this woman's faith is that it was tremendous, that it was out loud. In other words, like a megaphone. It was very loud and clear and not mistaken. What a compliment to get from Jesus, the Savior of the world, that your faith is so tremendous that it cannot be mistaken for anything else because it is loud and clear. Now let me add one other piece of information to this biblical account. There is only one other place in the entire New Testament where a person has this kind of Megas, faith. Only one other person, and you remember the centurion. The centurion came to Jesus and asked if he would please heal his servant. Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. If you remember, his servant was back at the house, and Jesus says to the man, well, I'll go with you. And he, the centurion says, look, I'm not even worthy to have you in my house. But if you just say the word, I know it'll happen. Matthew chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But you say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself of a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go, and he goes. I tell this one come, and he comes. I tell my servant to do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he was astonished, and he said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. There's that word, megos. See, the only two times this is used in the New Testament pertaining to a person's faith, and both of them were Gentiles. The centurion and the Canaanite woman. And I think that's pretty amazing. See, the mother had the patience and the persistence to walk the journey of faith, knowing that Jesus was the only answer. How's your walk today? How's your journey? How many times do you just stop? Because your faith isn't where it needs to be. How many times do you stop asking because the answer didn't come the way you wanted it? In other words, let me ask you this question. Do you have a mega faith or do you have a micro faith? By the way, micro is also a Greek word, but I don't think I need to tell you what that means. Where is your faith at today? Is it in you? Is it in your job? Is it in your ability? Or is it where it belongs? in Jesus Christ. See, I invite you to begin your journey, no matter what obstacles are in front of you, no matter what obstacles come along, that you be persistent in your faith in the one and the only one that can hear your plea and know your heart. That's Jesus Christ. Friends, I invite you today to accept the grace of God by faith in what Jesus has done for you at Calvary's cross and in Christian baptism, bury your old self and arise as a brand new person in Christ, ready to become the person that you need to be, praying that your faith goes from being a micro faith to being a megas faith. Now, if you think about every single person touched by Jesus in the New Testament, and there's only two people that had a megas faith, you can imagine as much in the church today. Where's your faith? How much do you have? And is it placed in the proper person? 